Well, a very good morning to you and welcome to our act of worship today on August the 23rd. It's great to have you with us, uh, whether you're with us uh, for the umpteenth time or for the first time, you're um, really welcome as we worship together. My name's Gemma and I'm the vicar at St Mary's and I'm going to be leading us through and exploring God's word um, for us this morning um, as we enter into uh, the second in our series uh, looking at the parable of the lost son. We're exploring this story that Jesus told over three weeks. Last week, uh, we focused particularly on the younger son in the story. And today, we're looking at the older son. And next week will be the father. And that's why um, I'm here on a farm, surrounded by the sights and the sounds and actually the smells of a farm too. I don't know whether in the background you can spot any sheep um, or a horse or if you look really closely in the distance you might be able to see two llamas in the far field. The older son in the story of the parable of the lost son was the one who had spent all his life working on his father's farm. This farm is in Wiltshire. But if you use your imagination, you might be able to transport yourself to what a Middle Eastern farm would have looked like in the time of Jesus. No doubt they would have had some livestock, they would have had crops growing, it would have been much sunnier for most of the year, a drier climate. But perhaps in your mind's eye, be taken there to that Middle Eastern farm as we enter into again this story that Jesus told. For me, it's a, a poignant story um, as I reflect particularly and resonate with the older son. I'm an older daughter, I have a younger brother and a younger sister and uh, many of the, the attitudes and the things that we hear the older son say in this story are things that uh, feel quite personal to me. In a moment, we're going to uh, watch a version of this story as told by Lego characters. And I hope that you enjoy that as a different way of entering into God's word. And then I'm going to be explaining, uh, well, sharing some thoughts uh, about it from a personal perspective. But first, let's pause, enjoy a moment or two of quiet, and then I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning knowing that you will accept us, not because we deserve it or because we're worthy, but because of your extravagant love. And we come to confess who we are and what we are and what we are not. We come because you call us and you love us. We come because you are the Lord and we are your people we come in Jesus name. Amen. Jesus then said, Once upon a time there was a man who had two sons. The youngest said to his father, Give me my share of the property now. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son took everything he had and travelled to another country. There he spent it on crazy living. When he had spent up, a famine spread across the country and he began to be in desperate need. So he hired himself out to a farmer and there he fed the pigs. As he was still hungry, he was even tempted to eat the pig's food and it was then it dawned on him. Even my father's workers had enough food and drink to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I'll go back to my father and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your workers. So he set off back to his father. Whilst he was still far away, his father spotted him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, go and bring out the best robe, put a ring on this finger, and kill the best fatted calf. Because tonight we shall celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. And so they began to celebrate. Now the older brother was in the field, and as he returned, he heard the music and dancing. He called to one of the slaves and asked what was going on. The servant replied, Your brother has come back and your father is celebrated by killing the best fatted calf, because he's returned safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father came out to talk to him. The older brother said to his dad, Listen, for all these years I've worked like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed you, and yet you've not even given me a young goat so I can celebrate with my mates. But when your son comes back, who spent everything on crazy living, you kill the best fatted calf. The father said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we must celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is now alive. He was lost, but now is found. Let's pray. Loving God, we pray that you would speak to us through this story this morning. That you'd soften our hearts and draw us close to you, that we might truly know your love. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, up until a couple of years ago, I really used to struggle to relate to this parable. Surely it's a story for people that haven't grown up in the church, I'd say. Surely it's a story for people who've lived in a way that is at odds with God's way of doing things. Surely it's a story for people who found themselves to be a long way off from God and need to have courage to return. If it's a story for people like that, then, well, it's not a story for people like me. Well, because I'm not like that. Running away, it's not part of my story. I'm not the younger son, so it's not a story for me. Right? Wrong. <laughs> The older son's moment in this story, I think, is when he bursts out with these words. Listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command. And yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. I'm the eldest child in my family and I've never quite understood my younger brother and sister. I was envious of their seeming freedom. They didn't seem to carry the burden of responsibility that I felt was mine to bear. And at times I was jealous of what I felt was their disobedience. The dutiful child turned into a dutiful teenager who, who pretty much breezed through adolescence. It never occurred to me to rebel. Well, why would I? I liked everything to be running smoothly, I liked for people to be happy and, and so I did my best to make that happen. I worked hard at school, I was involved at church, I had a part-time job, I had a nice boyfriend who later became a wonderful husband. I watched my brother and sister become teenagers and begin to rebel in all the usual kind of teenage ways. I watched my parents struggle at times with their rebellion. And I couldn't understand how they could be so tolerant, so loving. Over time, I noticed that there was a distance between me and my family. My parents had moved to the other end of the country, but I was distant from them in my heart too. I didn't agree with how relaxed they were with my siblings. I prided myself on being independent and capable, but deep inside, I had a longing to be cared for and looked after too. I craved that younger brother experience of being a long way off and then welcomed home. 
I was every inch a committed Christian, thoroughly involved with church life and my faith grew a lot during my early 20s. But God to me was a bit more like a strict headmaster who required my dutiful obedience and less like the loving father who we meet in this parable. I worked hard doing the things that were expected of me as a Christian and on the outside it probably seemed like I had it all sorted. But inside it was a different story. I was constantly aware of how far short I was falling. I could never meet the high standards of Christian living that I felt were required. I'd be hard on myself and resolve to do better next time, to pray more, to read the Bible more, to sin less, to care more for others. I'd been a Christian for many years, but I'd never felt I'd done enough to earn the Father's love. Of course, I did understand in a rational head kind of way that I was saved by grace through faith alone. But at a heart level, it was a different story. I never felt I'd done quite enough to deserve God's closeness or acceptance. But over time, I noticed something about this story that I'd never noticed before. We're told that on hearing the news about his brother, the older son became angry and refused to go in. And that means that the older son was outside too. He was away, he was out in the fields, he was separate and distant from the family home, the place of joy and celebration. And because of that, the father came out to the older son and he begged him to come in. And what struck me really powerfully was that the father treats both of his sons the same. Just as he went out to the younger brother when he saw him in the distance, he too went out to his older son. He needed to extend that same invitation to his oldest son because it's possible to become lost and to wander a long way from the father when you're doing all the right things. The older son, just like his younger brother, needed to come home too. What was it that had separated the older son from the love of his father? Well, I believe that it was resentment and fear. The more we seek to be acceptable and likeable, to be a good example to other people of how to avoid sin, the more we live in a constant fear of giving in to temptation. And the more we live like this, the harder it is for us to feel at home in our father's house secure in his love for us. And so our hearts begin to become filled with resentment and we subconsciously cry out, I tried so hard, I did so much. Why no reward? The older son didn't realise that the same love that propelled his father to hitch up his skirts and run down the road and welcome back the prodigal brother was also freely available to him too. The older son believed himself to be earning the love of the father through working hard on the farm, by being all that the oldest son is expected to be, the one who will eventually become the father himself. The younger brother never had any right to a share of the property. It was all supposed to go to the older son, but not so that he could be wealthy and his brother destitute but because the oldest son was expected to take on the responsibility and care for the whole household, his mother, his younger brother, his wife, children, all the servants, everything that the father had worked so hard for should have become the responsibility of the older son. And so through that lens, we can better understand the brother's shock and indignation at the generosity of his father, who at the beginning of his story divides up his estate between his two sons. That should not have happened. That in itself was a reckless, unexpected generosity towards the younger son and quite frankly, a massive kick in the teeth for the older brother. No wonder he bubbles with anger and resentment. 
And we see these same emotions displayed in the Pharisees, the one to whom Jesus is telling this story, because they were the good ones, the ones who lived in a way that appeared to please God. They were the ones who had earned the love of the Father. And so they can't get their heads around why Jesus would be bothering with sinners. Don't share God's love and blessing with them. They don't deserve it. It's supposed to be for us. We're the Jews, the ones that have been chosen since the beginning of time. And that's why there is such beauty and such brilliance in this story, because it demonstrates perfectly that God is not um, his love is not for one or the other. It's not for the chosen ones or the outsiders. It's not for the Jews or the Gentiles. It's not for the younger or the older brothers. It's for both. It's not or. It's and. It's always and. It's for you and it's for me. It's for those who have spent their whole lives in the church family and those who are just beginning to explore what it might mean to follow Jesus. It's for those whose lives look perfect and for those whose lives look a mess. It's for all and all of us need to accept it for ourselves. Whether we feel more like the older brother or the younger brother, we all need to come home, to come home to the father's heart we all need to be utterly convinced of his love. My Christian journey has been about an increasing awareness of the Father's love and how it doesn't depend on how dutiful I am. It doesn't depend on how hard I work. The Father moves towards me in love before I've done anything. He loves me because of who I am, his daughter, saved by grace through faith in his son Jesus. And I do know this truth about God's love in my head and in my heart, but I'm prone to forget it. And I don't think I'm alone in that. And I have to make a daily choice to trust in the father's love, to trust that I am his daughter wrapped up in his loving embrace, a recipient of the robe, the ring, the inheritance promised to me. And I have to trust that God isn't going to take his love away from me on the days when I fail to acknowledge him. He's not going to measure how deserving I am of his love based upon my performance. His love is simply there all the time, covering all the mess inside my heart, all the resentment, all the striving. That's what it means when we talk about God's grace, his love and his blessing poured out on us because we trust in Jesus, not because we deserve it or can earn it for ourselves. So older sons and younger sons need to trust. We need to trust that the father wants us home with him. We need to trust that we're loved and we need to cultivate gratitude Gratitude, I think, is the opposite of resentment. When we're stuck in resentment, we're feeling like we're not getting what we deserve. Gratitude is about realising that from God we receive so much already that we don't deserve. So every day we need to walk in trust and in gratitude. Trusting in God's love and grateful for it, recognising that however perfectly we live, however hard we work, we don't deserve God's love. And I'm still learning how to do that. I'm still prone to fear and resentment, worrying that I've disappointed God. No one can live in the full assurance of God's love all the time. We're human. We're frail. We're weak. And that's OK. God understands. But that's why we need each other. That's why the church exists. That's why older brothers need younger brothers and sisters. It's why God has called us to be a family so that we might live and work and pray and worship and serve, knowing beyond all doubt that we're loved, accepted and cherished by our Father in heaven. Let's pray.
Father, would you help us to become more and more aware of your great love for us? Bless us with the space to reflect on that in the days ahead. And would you bless us with an awareness with our senses and in our minds of your closeness and your delight in us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's continue now in a prayer of confession and then praying for others. Welcome back to the farm. I'm joined here by Kezia, my daughter, and she's going to help us now as we turn to God in prayer. We're first going to uh, join together in some words of confession, and then we're going to turn to intercession, to praying for others in our world. So let's pray. God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us. Save, Save us, us and, and help us. us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. Save, Save us, us and, and help us. us. For failing you by what we do, think and say. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by the temptations of the world about us. Father, forgive us. Save, Save us, us and, and help, help us. us. For living as if we are ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us. Save, Save us and, and help us. us. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us pardon and peace now and forever. Amen. Amen. So as we turn now to pray for others, we're going to use three different props to um, aid us in our prayers. The first is this inflatable world that Kezi is holding here. And that's going to help us to pray for those who, like the younger son in the story, had to leave their homes and travel to distant countries. And we know that there are still so many uh, people who are displaced from their own countries and traveling as refugees um, across many thousands of miles. So let's pray now for them. Loving God, it's hard for us to imagine what life is like for those who live constantly on the move, having left all that they knew and loved about their own countries and traveling to distant shores, not knowing uh, what welcome they will receive when they get there. Lord, we thank you so much for all the different charities and agencies working with refugees across the world. And we pray that you would bless them with the resources that they need so that these people might receive the help and the support and the welcome that they deserve. Lord, we pray that you would uh, open our hearts towards those in need of any kind, that you would increase our compassion and help us to take action. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Our next prop is this angry face. You might like to make an angry face uh, just now uh, as entering into this time of prayer. In the parable of the lost son, the older son uh, was so angry at the party and the welcome that the younger son received uh, when he returned home. And we know that there are so many people in our world who are consumed by a sense of anger and feel that they've been treated unfairly by life. So let's pray for them now. Loving God, we think of all those who are consumed by anger and hatred. 
perhaps towards particular groups of people or towards you or simply towards life itself. Lord, we know that when anger and hatred consume us, it leaves little space for love and compassion and life in all its fullness. So would you help those who feel angry today to work through that emotion and to come to a place of peace? And Lord, where we feel angry and perhaps unforgiving towards others, would you help us to bring all of those feelings to you? And would you help us to work through them? Trusting in the power of your Holy Spirit that can bring healing and new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our final prop for our intercessions is a balloon. Balloons often found at parties and the older son in the story felt excluded from the party that was being thrown for his younger brother. And so we're going to use this balloon to help us to pray for those who feel excluded from the party. That could be uh, many different people um, for many different reasons. But we're going to focus particularly on those who feel for some reason that they are excluded from the party um, that is the kingdom of God. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you welcome all who want to follow you to join the party, the party of the kingdom of God. Father, we pray for those who are part of churches across the world, but who don't feel quite as if they fit. That for some reason, perhaps because of things that others have said or things that they feel about themselves, they're outsiders, not truly welcome. We pray that every church would be truly welcoming, particularly to those who are different in any way from the majority of the church family. We pray for those who feel a sense of pain and sadness because of the way that they are excluded. And Lord, we ask that you help us to be people who are truly welcoming whose arms are open wide, just like the father's arms were in the story of the lost son. So that many, many more people might come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to be led now in the Lord's Prayer. So let's continue to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. We're going to conclude our time of worship together by singing in worship. And it's great this morning that we've got John Monaghan, who is vicar of St Edith's in Sea Mills, and his wife Alice and daughter Clara leading us as guest worship leaders today. We're going to be singing, Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. You may well know that uh, C. Mills uh, Church is part of the Avonside Mission Area and uh, together we're seeking to work in mission and to share resource and ideas. So it's a real privilege to have uh, John and Alice and Clara leading worship for us today. 
So let's lift up our praise to God. Oh, praise the name. so much to John and Alice and Clara for leading us there. We're nearly at the end of our service. Um, a couple of notices before we conclude. The first is uh, really exciting to tell you that um, next Sunday afternoon 
afternoon, the 30th of August from 12.30 till 2.30. We're going to be St Mary's together outdoors. We're going to be on the front lawn of Trinity College just off Stoke Hill and uh, gathering together for a bring your own picnic and a chance to see each other in person. You might not have seen members of the church family for quite some time. So we're going to really celebrate together. There'll be some socially distant games and um, an opportunity to enter into a short uh, all age act of worship as part of that too. If you're on the uh, mailing list for church, do um, take the opportunity to read uh, more about that. We've sent you details. Also to say that the PCC are meeting this week to agree a plan for returning to gathered worship on Sundays from the beginning of September. So um, we'll be writing to all of you so that you know what's happening. Um, do bear with us. Um, there are still lots of restrictions in place. We're not able to return to a, a format of worship that will be like what we had before or perhaps even uh, very much ideal uh, for this next season but um, we are looking forward to being able to regather in person on Sundays from the 6th of September and for the next uh, two weeks you can continue to join us on Wednesdays as we have our six o'clock service of Holy Communion in church it's been lovely to see lots of you there for that too and finally, just to say a big thank you to all of you who gave towards the Mission Gift Day at the beginning of July. We raised um, very nearly £10,000 for our mission partners and uh, donations to 13 different uh, charities and organisations have been sent off uh, in the last week or so. So thank you again that your gifts really do make a difference. Let's conclude with a prayer. Father, you have loved us and saved us. You have held us and healed us and made our lives whole. You have given us new hope and new life. You have filled us with your spirit and fed us with your word. And you have called us to live for you so send us in your name to serve you and glorify you forever. Amen. I hope you have a really blessed week. I hope you're able to connect with people in meaningful ways. And I hope that many of you will join us now over Zoom for a coffee and a chance to connect with your church family. We'll see you soon.